And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Mira Kelly, consciousness architect, past life regressionist, and international best-selling author of the book Beyond Past Lives. Mira, thank you for joining me today and welcome. Hello, Jeff. I'm so excited for us to be talking. Thank you for having me. Mira, what do you love about past life regression? Mm, um, Past life regression is a tool, a gateway, a portal that allows us to dive not only into the soul's journey. So it doesn't allow us only to see the bigger picture of things and to marvel at the magnificence of the universe and how much more is out there than what the 3D reality allows us to perceive. But also on a very practical level, past life regression allows us to solve our challenges right here and right now, today, what we need. So to me, it's both a very mystical modality and also a very practical modality. And I love the combination of both. And I love what I'm able to accomplish with the clients I work with in terms of change and transformation. Is there a limit to how many of our past lives we can connect with? There's definitely no limit. However, there's the personal moment of saying, okay, now let me apply what I've learned and be here and put it all into practice. So um, in terms of limit, no, because you can explore not only human lifetimes, but also animal lifetimes on other stars and galaxies, other forms of consciousness that you and I hardly ever think of, such as such as stones and angels and ETs. In other words, everything is out there to be tapped in and learned from and experienced. And that potential is vast. And I love to use that vast potential to make it relevant to where we are. And there also comes a moment when we say, oh, but let me let me live right here, right now and apply everything that I'm learning. So are you saying that you are regressing animals or are you regressing humans <laughs> and they have been animals and other things humans who have been animals but i have to tell you i also love working with children because i usually work with adults and adults remember other lifetimes being being a uh, being being other other con- forms of consciousness but i also love working with children because the subconscious is so available for exploration and tapping into answers. But let me tell you a story of an animal lifetime since we're talking about this, right? So um, a client comes in and she spoke of having all these digestion issues. And she had become a digestion, a healthy digest, a healthy digestion coach, which was teaching other women how to combine food and movement and and a, a deeper understanding into our emotions and how that affects the body. And so she experienced a past life where she was a wolf, and the wolf died out of starvation, and there was a lot of emotions around that lifetime and and the processing of it. And so she came out of the regression with me and she was feeling really moved and transformed. And then sometime later, I checked in with her and she said, I think I need a new profession because I'm not able to emotionally relate with my clients anymore. I am healed. My digestion issues are not here anymore. And and so it was a big moment of she and I chuckling and being like, yeah, that's how it goes with regression. It, It goes right to the core of what we need and allows us to change emotionally and then a whole new world opens up. So I work with people in solving all kinds of problems, em- emotional issues, relationship challenges, uh, uh, money and finances, success, health issues. So yes, it's all available. Why do you think we're not healed during the in-between lives before we come back? I don't think that it's not so much that we are not healed. I think that we choose. I love this question. Thank you. Brilliant question. Um, I think we are born here with a particular focus that and a challenge that we're looking to explore. And for some of us, that challenge presents immediately right away through physical limitation, right? The physical body. 
And for others, we set it up as an emotional challenge. Hardly ever have I met, come to think of it, none of us has had the perfect family environment, right? There's always something, there's a friction of some sort. And we choose that kind of a stage so that from there on, we can use it as a trampoline for our own discoveries, our own growth. So I don't necessarily see it as we come as somehow imbalanced and that there is something that we need to perfect in our souls. I think that more than anything, it's... um. It's a setup that we do so that we can, in a very particular and focused way, learn to use thought and emotion in a very intentional way. Did that make sense to you what I just said? Mm -hmm. I can elaborate much more, but no need if it made sense. In other words, we set up a game and say, okay, by me going through this labyrinth, through this game, whatever the game is, right? Relationship issues, uh, mommy issues, daddy issues, cancer issues, whatever the challenge is, that's my labyrinth. But as I go through it, I am using my tools. And the most important tool for me to ma master is thought and emotion. And by me focusing on those, I'm able to go through very quickly or feel helpless and go backwards and lose my way. But any, anyways, it's always a learning to the soul, right? It's always a, 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 an expansion and creativity. And, and so that's also the reason why lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, we repeat the same pattern, the same challenge, because so many of us are asleep while we drive the bus, right? Literally, we think, oh no, the outside world is causing this condition. It's my dad's fault. It's my mom's fault. It's all the bullies who bullied me. And that's the reason I am the way I am. And that is just another form of not owning our power and not owning our the power of us directing thought and emotion and and getting our so so that's the reason why we keep repeating the same pattern lifetime after lifetime after lifetime and then at a certain point we start waking up and we start saying wait a minute I cause the outside. The outside doesn't cause me. So what if I start changing? And that's when we start so solving these problems and that these challenges, these issues. And that's when we actually reach a point where we say, oh, been here, done that. I'm done with this reincarnational cycle. I've mastered this level of the game, right? I'm ready for the next one. It's interesting that you say that because a lot of people in the audience and guests quite often will comment or say that they're not coming back next time. Yeah, can I say something about that? I was literally thinking of making a comment on it. I find it very interesting that in the moment of struggling with life, we're so adamant and we're so angry and we're like, I am never doing that again. My soul, you made a huge mistake, never doing that again. And the moment we actually start feeling our power and we start solving things and we start finding our way, actually life becomes delicious. And it literally, it doesn't matter anymore whether I reincarnate or not any longer because it doesn't matter. I got to figure it out. And even if new challenges come up, I trust myself and I trust life to figure it out, right? And so that's actually the sign that chances are we are at the end of the reincarnational cycle. Do people ever discover in their past lives that they have committed some act that created a karmic account that they have to come back this time to resolve it. Mm, most definitely. However, here's the thing. Because to us as a soul, it's part of our journey, part of our experience. It doesn't seem dramatic. It doesn't seem, oh my God. It's like, yeah, well, this happened when I move on. So here I'm thinking of a specific client right now where this client experienced being a woman who committed a murder on a hike, killed her partner. And, and she came out of, the client came out of that regression. And to her, it was like, you know, it just feels 
part of my consciousness. It doesn't feel shocking. It doesn't feel horrible. And so whenever people say to me, oh, I don't know, I'm a little scared of experiencing a past life regression. I don't, I don't want to burden myself and feel guilty for other things I have done. And I'm, I have enough to deal with in this life as it is. I always tell them, you know, to your soul, it will feel very normal, just like what happened yesterday feels very normal. Do you feel that the healing from learning about or experiencing your past life comes from re-establishing or getting in touch with the emotions at the time or just learning about what happened? I think it's a, a combination of both because you, the, the learning always brings an emotional experience. So uh, when I work with clients, I'm not a psychic who reads people's past, right? And, and those always have very little detail, those readings where somebody tells you, you have been a witch in a past life where you were burned at the stakes and that's why you're afraid of speaking up and that's why you're afraid of sharing your healing gifts with the world and that might resonate with the person who hears that but there isn't the emotional cathartic depth there isn't the textures and the colors and the vividness and the richness and the details of different moments through that lifetime and when I guide people that's exactly what they experience they go from one important moment to the next to the next and they see the unfoldment of the whole life and obviously that comes with a lot of emotional experiences and those combined with understanding, perceiving things and the learning of like, oh, I get how that got to be that way actually creates uh, the emotional healing and the cathartic healing. And from there on, immediately there's the adjustment. Oh, I now know what to do. I know how to do it differently. And so inevitably the person reaches a place and an understanding of being like, yeah, and I'm done. Let's do it differently in this life. I know better. I can do better. Now, how you got involved with this is because you read a book that actually gave you a script on how to do it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I was very intrigued reading this book on past life regression at the possibilities and so I created a recording for myself and I experienced a very uh, very intense past life talking about the guilt in other lifetimes right and so in this lifetime I saw myself as a woman who I was a spy. However, the front of what I was doing was to be a doctor. And so as this doctor, um, it was during World War II, as this doctor, I experienced very, very vividly the moment of pouring some kind of a poison into a glass of water and giving it to uh, this person who was part of the uh, Nazi structure, a, a very powerful and important person. And instead of healing him I poisoned the man and there was this moment of me looking up and just you know that checking in with yourself of, oh is this the right thing to do am I doing this and and then the next scene was how I was running down this brick hallway dimly lit brick hallway trying to open these wooden doors and they were all locked and and I can see how I was dressed I can see the clothes it was all very vivid and and the 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 adrenaline rushing through my body. So imagine going from a complete peace and meditative state to dropping into this intense running for your life, like literally running for your life moment. And one of the doors gave in, one of the handles of the doors gave in and I rushed into the room and there was no way out. And there was just a tiny little window at the top where the wall was meeting uh, the, the, the ceiling with bars on it. And I knew that I was trapped. And the next scene that I saw was um, I was watching outside of the body, but I saw myself being executed on an electric chair. And so here's what's so extraordinary. I, this story sounds intense, right? Like to mm -hmm. most people listening to this, they'll be like, Whoa! I don't want to experience that. But to me, I came out of this experience with very much, huh, 
Okay, this explains a few things. I'm terrified up until that point, I was terrified to hear uh, a German language being spoken. Oh, that explains things. Also, it explains why just seeing people with guns around me, you know, people, soldiers, army people, would always just bring me to a state of terror. And wait a minute, what is the lesson here? Focus on love, focus on love, focus on love. And so, it was a very, very, I didn't, I didn't take it as Mira is a bad person. Does that make sense? I didn't mm -hmm. take it as now I have to do things to clear up that. I took it as I, I know how to serve better and to do better. And also imagine experiencing this when you're 13 and understanding at such a young age that there is such a thing as reincarnation and the world is a much bigger, the universe is a much bigger place than the streets on my, you know, in my little town. And so um, it was the beginning. And from there on, I learned how to use past life regression to heal my physical body to receive answers, to connect. And I've been doing the same for so many people. And the blessings are extraordinary. Imagine, Jeff, every day being out there at the cusp of consciousness, knowing itself and discoveries and emotional understandings and the wisdom we all carry within, ourse within ourselves, right? Absolutely amazing. When somebody comes to you, do you start with like, what is the fear you have in life? And let's try regressing that. So when somebody comes to me, I always ask them, let's talk about your life. Tell me what you think is relevant. And please tell me what are your challenges right now? The other day, I was working with a client who uh, has a stage four breast cancer. I work with a lot of cancer uh, uh, patients, people who have cancer, but not really just that, right? Literally everything. And so, and so she was telling me about her relationship with her mom. She was telling me how she has been able to forgive her stepfather, her dad. There's been so much work that she has done. And yet there's something still hanging on with her mom. She still feels a lot of rage, a lot of anger. Um, and so, um, oh gosh, did I say breast cancer? Forgive me. I, 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 I really actually esophageal cancer, esophagus cancer, but same thing, stage four. And uh, and so she she also spoke about a whole lot of different things in her life. And then she spoke about, oh, and just by the way, right before we began, she mentioned, oh, and I really have a terror of throwing up, this intense fear of choking on my own vomit. And so we dove in and there was so much understanding, so much healing. And believe it or not, the vomit imprint, the vomit pain and suffering has been caused in this lifetime. And this is how it actually happened. So she experienced a lifetime where she she had been the slave serving others and all of that and so forth. Then she experienced a lifetime where amidst serving others, she also fell in love with someone who loved her for her. And so as she was with this person who loved her for her, she made this very clear comment of, I don't need to serve. I'm here to receive. Somebody loves me for me without me giving. And I thought to myself, huh, this is a very interesting comment to make, right? It's a very specific thing. So this person feels like a servant. And so I, I asked that we see where else that she feels like a servant, where else that connects to her, to her healing, uh, to her cancer issue. And she experienced a lifetime where she was married to a man who treated her like a servant rather than a wife, who was very abusive and violent, and to show her who was in charge, very often he would choke her. And uh, one time they were eating and he just went a little too far. And so there was the association in her mind between 
love comes with too big of a price, right? The psyche made that association. Love is unsafe, but love and food are unsafe, right? Isn't that interesting? Because they combined in that moment. And so when she was younger in this life, when she was ba a baby, she was throwing, she went to a moment of throwing up. And this is a woman who doesn't remember most of her childhood. So it's not like it was a conscious memory. She was remembering under regression throwing up and the mom being so frustrated and feeling these feelings of what do I do with this baby and shaking her. And, and the psyche immediately clicked into that fear of, oh, is this the death of me? And so from there on, she created this weird, strange relationship with food, where food was something she couldn't trust. Love was something she couldn't trust. Mom was someone she couldn't trust. And so before developing the cancer, she was already developing these closures in her esophagus so that she couldn't ingest food. And all the food had to be pureed. It was really a nightmare actually receiving, 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 receiving love. And so all of that combined, and now there is the 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 fear of of the of food, right? The fear of vomiting, the terror of what that could be. And so these are the intricate details of the psyche that I absolutely love, right? I could have just told her, well, but don't be afraid of, of vomiting. You're a grown up. You don't need to worry about that. But it doesn't work that way until the subconscious is reassured, until the subconscious and the mind see the source of it. It's not so easy to let go. But once the mind knows, the mind is like, ah, no big deal. Uh, now I can now focus on receiving, on the safety of love, on the safety of food. And so this is what I love so much about what I do, just diving very deep with people and figuring it out. That was an amazing story. Are there patterns for certain problems? I think each one of us has our own patterns, right? Our own soul's pattern. And and so like like the little pieces that, that I was able to catch with this woman, and so much of it is actually intuition and listening and perception, right? It's not just executing a process um, because then I will be no different a, a doc, than a doctor giving a medicine, right? Let's use the same medicine for everything. Not that I'm putting doctors down, God bless them. We need them but it's it's so much is tapping into and listening to what is the pattern of that person of their own rhythm and their own soul and and it's really fascinating to me and and i have to tell you my fascination with patterns has been really twofold because of first perceiving the patterns in each person, but then also being able to recognize that there also are patterns we share. For example, women who find themselves with breast cancer, since I spoke it, it's a little more on the forefront of my mind. Usually there's the pattern of a partner that they not only over give to, but feel unheard and appreciated. So breast cancer is not only over giving and un feeling underappreciated and when is it going to be my turn, but then layered with a lot of anger. How could you do this to me? How could I do this to myself to put myself in this position? Really fascinating. So it's not just a personal pattern, but also it's a twofold situation, if you will. Yeah. When I meant patterns, I was going to say something like people who are afraid of the water. Like, is it yeah. generally seen that they had drowned in a previous life? I would say yes. And let's explore, right? Yes. And the caveat but who knows what is individually about the person? Because um, for some people who are terrified of water, I've had experiences with clients like that. It's not actually a water. It's about being in the gas chambers during World War II. Nothing to do with water, but it's the suffocation, right? It's the feeling of being trapped and suffocating. So that's why my, my answer is always, okay, well, maybe. And now let's see. Do you think that when somebody has a pattern of similar dreams over and over, they're dreaming or re-experiencing their past lives? Oh, gosh. And very clearly when it's a specific experience, right? Very, very much so. Um, and, and, 
And we can turn that around and use it for the positive, right? So I believe that in the dream space, not only do we um, process through what happens during the day, but we also try, learn, serve, do many other things. And we also try on multiple different versions of the future. And so intentionally, people can ask that they experience a particular kind of dream, which serves them. So for example, as people go to sleep, they can tell themselves, tonight in my dreams, I will solve this problem. Tonight in my dreams, I will communicate with this person I haven't spoken to in five years and will clear things. Tonight in my dreams, I will clear all my anger. Tonight in my dreams, I will receive a healing dream so that my ankle heals, right? And so we can intentionally use the dream space to... Um, to create more because to our dreaming self, our awake self is the dreamer. What is your favorite regression case that you've had personally when regressing someone? Oh my God, this is asking somebody, for example, an author, what is your favorite book and or a musician, what is your favorite song? And the truth of the matter is that every case is my favorite in the moment of it happening, literally, because what happens with me is I literally fall in love with people. I see the, I see the struggle, I see the strength and the power in them. I see the wisdom, I see how they're really figuring it out. I admire that. I admire they, their soul's journey and setting up the challenges for them, right? I admire how people use physical illness as a way of healing and growth and consciousness shifts and expanding. And so all of that brings me to a place of after every session, feeling so incredibly in love with life and empowered and excited by, by their strength, by their vibrancy. So Honestly, every session is a favorite. Do you believe in parallel lives? I definitely speak a lot about that. And um, my work, my book, Beyond Past Lives, that you mentioned, was definitely a revolutionary approach in that because I started speaking about parallel lives long before it was out there available in the world of regression. And it came to me through my own experience, but also the experience of so many of my clients where they um, where they experienced the same lifetime, but different versions of it or more than than two. And, and that's when it becomes even more exciting to think of how consciousness doesn't just flow linearly, but mushrooms out of itself, right? One experience mushrooms into another, into then a million more. Some people even believe that all our lives are happening at the same time. Do you? Mm -hmm. I do. Yeah. Because that's really what it implies. If they're parallel, that, it, that means that all of them are happening at the same lifetime. So the lifetime somebody had in ancient Egypt or Atlantis or um, 10 years ago is happening right now. Yeah. And that to me would make sense that why they haven't healed in the in-between, you know? Yeah. But you see what you're speaking is about linearity. Right. In other words, they just haven't had time to integrate or they are um, or they are moving forward linearly or time is moving too fast. But it's all the same moment. It's all part of the same experience. Right. So when I write a book, it seems that it's one experience, but also within that one experience, there's a little, there's a million little moments of me having insights and understanding and adventures and challenges. Now compare that to a soul's journey through lifetimes. They have all happened right now, right? It's one process of writing a book, but also the different lifetimes are happening just akin, similar to me having these little moments of sitting down, understanding, reading searching, writing. So, so it's all both simultaneous and happening at the same time. Do you teach people how to connect with their higher selves? I definitely do. Yes. Um, because I believe that 
our higher selves are so focused and so desiring for us to succeed and to not only make it work, but make it work absolutely great and amazing through life that um, being aware of the support of our higher self being there and knowing how to receive that guidance is so important for each and every one of us. And I know that everybody listening now is wondering and saying, well, how? And the how is very simple. Just pay attention to your instincts and impulses because that's how our higher selves guide us on a moment to moment basis, moment to moment to moment. Do you think it's safe to do past life regression while you're alone? Most definitely. There is no way for people to get stuck in a past life because think about it. You don't get stuck in your dreams. You don't get stuck when you meditate. You don't get stuck when you daydream. So not possible to get stuck during a past life regression either. You might experience emotions, but you also experience emotions when you daydream or remember what happened 10 years ago, right? And 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 so it's really safe. It's really available for people to, um, to connect with other lifetimes. And I'm excited for people to dive into it and do it for themselves. Over the past few years, ASMR videos have become popular on YouTube. And I notice in your blog, you have a post about it. What are you doing with ASMR? Um, yes, isn't it, it, it's been such a wonderful development to bring soothing to the nervous system and connect us with sounds and with feelings and with physical experiences that bring calm and safety to our nervous system and so i i have a, an asmr um, experience for people to connect with which is all about self-love it's all about bringing love to who we are mm, that's interesting i was just they can find it on youtube very easily yeah i was thinking about it because so many asmr videos they're whispering okay let's have yeah. you relax you know <laughs> so are you actually doing like a meditation with ASMR or are you just doing kind of like all the sound effects? So my ASMR is all about my voice. So the, 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 the intention and the voice. And so for those who are interested in that, you should dive in and check it out and let me know what you think. What's the name of your YouTube channel? It's, it's just my name, Mira Kelly. All right, great. And Kelly spelled L-L-E-Y, yes. Also on your YouTube channel, there is a video about the trick to manifesting money. So what is the trick? <laughs> there, there are so many things we can talk about when, it, uh, when we come up with the subject of money. But here is uh, uh, something that I can offer right now. I'm writing a book, completing a book on our relationship with money. So it's on the forefront of my mind. Treat money as a lover. Treat money as a partner. Because we have a very contentious, most of us, we have a very contentious and challenging relationship with money money. And if you were to compare your relationship with money and with a, a, a lover, what, what are the similarities? What are the parallels? Do you say, I need more time? It's not enough. I need money to sit in my bank account a little longer. In other words, are you talking about, I need people to stay in my life a little longer and not abandon me? So think of your relationship with money through the prism of as if money were an avatar, as if money were a person, how would you want that to improve? And it's a different way to think about money because we always think of it as something that is not here for me unless we have a very good relationship with money, right? And so right then and there, we can begin opening up the experience by, by allowing for praise and gratitude, by allowing for appreciation of everything that has come into our lives. Because imagine if I were to tell my partner, you know, honey, you're so not enough. You're so not enough. You're always late. You never bring me flowers. You never pay attention to what I need. When are you going to get home? I need a specific time, 6 p.m. And when it turns to be 6.15, I'm already freaking out. I'm like, where are you, right? 
a partner will never stand for that. They will never, they'll run away. They will never want to stick around. And so how can you perceive your relationship with money through the prism of a human relationship? And how can you be a better partner to money? Because money always follows. We lead much like with any relationship, right? Each one of us who can see a bigger, a bigger vision and, and is more willing to own their power and the decision of our choices. We lead in our relationships. So how can you lead in your relationship with money? Have you ever come across this? Someone who self-sabotages their financial success in this lifetime is doing it because in a previous life, they were super successful and perhaps they were robbed and killed over it. Most definitely, absolutely, and 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 I can think right now of how much the Puritan work ethic and beliefs actually have imprinted our consciousness as a society, but also our soul's journey and development. So, so I can think of a client who experienced being a very successful merchant. Um, in Amsterdam and as this man this woman the client experienced being this man who was a very successful merchant didn't have much of a relationship with his wife it was just very you know cold and distant he had a son who was successful was being an attorney but there wasn't the the love and the connection in the family and this man was very good with money and trade and making money but he saw money as something that needed to be given to the church something that immediately needed to be disposed of so even though this man was very good at making money there was fear of money all right, he didn't trust himself with more. He was afraid that he'll go all the wrong places. And there was in one particular scene that I remember her describing where uh, she, him, was coming back from uh, working and would just walk down the cobble streets. And there was a entertainment establishment that nowadays we'll call it a bar, a pub, and how he would hear all the happy noises. And he would always think of them with scorn of they're up to no good. They've gone the devil's way, right? It's all about hard work, just work, just work, just work. And there was no heat in this man's house, even though he could afford the heat, there was no place pleasure he would always pass by these boats you know how the canals in Amsterdam have these boats and he would yearn for adventure he would yearn to see where a boat could possibly take him but there was no sense of I'm allowed it was always that stringent I work I work I work I work and then I give it all away and so sure enough, in this lifetime, she was able by experiencing that to solve this need to work hard and then the money disappears. I work and the money disappears. Where did the money go? Right. That was her challenge. And so um, it was it was a, a, a profound opening up to be like, oh, wait. I get to create a new relationship with money. Money is a tool. Money is a partner. Money is somebody I can trust myself with. And how do I want it to be from now on? I'm sure you meet all kinds of people. And a common question from people to you is, are past life regressions or past lives actually real? What is your answer to them? Anybody who has ever had children will will say that their child doesn't come as a blank slate. Gosh, I have cats. Even the cats are different from one another, right? Much less little humans. And so the reason why a child is different from another child, even though it's technically the same family, they should be the same. They, sh they should be raised the same. They should come out the same. And the reason why we're so different is because which one of us has created different experiences through different lifetimes, different 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 growth opportunities. And so when that, that to me is a very obvious answer right then and there, because every person who has ever been around little people will immediately say, yeah, yeah, they don't come as blank slates. They come with their own preferences, their own idiosyncrasies, their own ways of doing things. But then also there are other clues. When people visit places, there is sometimes the familiarity of, I know where I am. I can walk through this 
town, city I've never been in without a map, without knowing where I'm going, but it feels like home. I know where I'm going. Or preferences or hatred for languages or food. Um, similarly, when people are connecting with other people, there is the immediate, I love you, or oh my God, I hate you. And I do not know why, but I cannot stand you. So all those are little clues we have that we are not meeting for a first time. But also during a past life regression, when a person is going through the experience and people come out and say, did I imagine all of this? I always tell them, you know, if you were to talk to a therapist, they will put you in a meditative state and they'll ask you to share what's on your mind and then they'll see that as information in your subconscious that needs to be analyzed and understood so to a therapist there is value in it if you were to talk to a quantum physicist they'll tell you everything exists right here right now so you're not really imagining anything you're just cross connecting with something for a first time and becoming aware of it and from my point of view I tell people, was there an emotion to it? Because emotions are always a very clear indication of this meant something. This is a real experience versus, you know, um, just something that you read in a book and no big deal. But more imp most importantly, the real question to ask ourselves is, is this experience relevant? Is it relevant to where I am and to what I'm doing? And the answer is always, Absolutely. What about deja vu? Is that due to experiencing a past life? Deja vu is an example of time being simultaneous, of time flowing backwards, if you will. Not that time flows backwards, but that it's available for us to cross connect with the future, but experience it from a future moment going backwards. So to me, deja vu is a clear, clear experience that we've all had of, oh, time is simultaneous. I've been here. I've done that, even though I haven't. And talking about time, I want to mention something else. We always think of going forward in time, but I'm also a huge believer in using the power of going backwards in time, obviously through past life regression, but I mean something else here changing the past. So, not only creating a new future, not only using the present point to imagine and create a better future, but also using the power of the present moment to change the past. Because if time is simultaneous, what that means is that the past is available. It's not done and over with. It's available right here, right now for us to tap into it and change it because it's happening right now. So if it's happening, then there is another future version of that moment that I can cross connect and benefit from right here, right now. And it doesn't mean that, you know, tomorrow I'm going to wake up to a different man in my bed and be like, oh my God, I'm married to a different person. It means I am able to use opportunities and advantages I didn't take advantage of and receive them as experiences right now, opportunities, friends, help, pathways, right? In other words, I'm opening up the past in a whole different way. And there is a huge mistake that people do when they say, oh, well, that was the past. It's long ago. You can just let it go. It doesn't matter. I believe the past needs to be changed and retold for a real profound emotional healing. Do you think that it's really changing the past or changing our perception or the story we tell ourselves about the past? I love that you're asking that question because it's not really changing the past. It's changing the perception by cross-connecting with another time stream. And by cross-connecting with another time stream, we change who we are in the moment. Yeah. 
Now, earlier you mentioned aliens. Have you regressed anybody and they've told you they were an alien on another planet? Most definitely. Most, most definitely. Um, so people find themselves oftentimes in physical bodies that are very different than what human bodies look like. And people go on all these different missions on other planets back on Earth. So, yes. I love those stories. Has anybody ever told you anything during a regression that just completely blew your mind, like almost changed you fundamentally of who you are? Most definitely. That's actually how the beginning of my past life regression work started. So up until that point, I used to think of reincarnation as a linear progression, one lifetime after another. Hopefully in one lifetime, we learn a little more. We don't incur too much karma because, you know, next time we need to do something about it. Um, but I, ex uh, I had an experience with a client who went through five lifetimes that were all happening around the same period of time. And to me, it was mind blowing. How is it possible that this man just told me he died in say 1975. And in this lifetime, the second lifetime, he's telling me he's born in 1950. To me, that was didn't make sense. How could that possibly be? And so that was the cathartic moment that opened up past life regression in a whole new way for me. And that's that what led to that's what led to me writing Beyond Past Lives. And once the book was already out and everything was already in motion, I um, was speaking to Brian Weiss. And Brian Weiss is somebody I have learned from, somebody who has pioneered the field of past life regression tremendously. Um, man I admire and respect so much. And so we, we were speaking and uh, I was telling him about this experience. And he said to me, it always happens that way. The same thing happened to me. I had a cathartic for me personally experience with a client that took me out of the clinical work I was doing and, and working with people for me to open up to the work of reincarnation and past life regression and for me similar thing happened that's what moved me away from saying okay I really want to do this full time I used to be a corporate attorney when this this came about in my life and I want to serve people through past life regression so so it was really a profound experience that changed me and I know it has been by me sharing that story and writing about it and people reading about it in my my book, it has changed other people as well. Was that a huge transition for you, moving mm. from being an attorney to a past life regressionist? The huge transition was happening while I was deciding that it was possible and available for me. So I had to change a lot of beliefs and expectations of how my life will be, of how money would work for me, right? Because up until that point, I even didn't believe it interesting or exciting or or anything that, that that was on my mind for me to run my own business right to to do something on my own up until that point it wasn't even a thought on my mind and and so there I was um really choosing and teaching myself to keep choosing to trust the universe that if it's on my heart that this the desire of my heart is not a problem, but it's a gift. And, and at first it was a problem, right? Because there it is. I wanted to uh, make a living and serve others and engage myself in this work of past life regression. And I didn't believe it possible. I didn't believe people will be interested and didn't believe I can pay my student loans with it, right? All of that. And, and, and not only that, but so, so at first it was really a problem and I was teaching myself to trust that if it's on my heart, there is a way and it's not a problem, but it's a gift. So to really walk that path and, and show up knowing that the universe will show up for me. And, and so isn't it interesting how, because I had to figure out this whole question of purpose for myself nowadays, 
one of the biggest questions people come to me with is always, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? What am I here for? And then I roll up my sleeves and I say, okay, let's figure it out. Cause I did it for me and it, it seemed hard at the moment, but then once I crossed that bridge of change, it seemed like the most natural thing. So, right. The most obvious and natural thing. So let's figure it out for you too. Do you discover a person's purpose in the in-between of lives? So, so also through the experience of past life regression as well, it's incredibly healing for people to experience happy lifetimes, even though up until now I've been telling you only dramatic stories, it's incredibly opening for people to say, oh, wait, so I lived my purpose in this other lifetime and nothing bad happened. In fact, I was supported. People were loving. People were kind. People benefited from my gifts. Everything was wonderful. Oh, so it's available in this lifetime as well. So, so definitely through the experience of regression, people can work on that. Yeah. What does it take for someone to become a past life regressionist? Like, do they have to go to hypnotherapy school? First and more, foremost, great love for the subject, because this is not something we want to do just because, you know, it starts off usually by people having their own personal experience and being blown away by it, much like me, and then wanting to share the power of this tool with others. And so then the next thing is to learn from somebody like me. I teach people how to do past life regression and to learn not only only the intricacies, but also learn by doing, right? Just learn by being in the trenches, learn by guiding people. And, and, and so it's definitely something that is not only something that we learn by, by committing to doing past life regression for people. It's not only something that we serve others with, but we tremendously benefit on a personal level because I get to learn in the most brilliant way every day, right? Every day as I work with clients, I get to learn and I'm blown away. I'm amazed. It's profoundly exciting. It seems so it's personally for me too, right? Not just for the client. It seems like past life regression is beneficial to everyone, and it would be amazing if insurance would pay for it. <laughs> I look forward to that day, right? I look forward to that day. <laughs> so are you basically a writer now, an author, or are you still practicing and regressing people? I'm really all the things. So my love for past life regression has never left. So I continue to do past life regressions with people. I continue to write. And, and also um, a very significant part of my work that gives me tremendous fulfillment and tremendous uh, change for people is coaching. So I do that in group settings through whatever classes I offer, coaching one-on-one. -on -one. So I do all the things. So to me, purpose is not about a single job description, right? The way you spoke of it, are you a writer or are you an accountant? To me, purpose is about being the most I can be, following what excites me, what is interesting to me, what is the most creative and fulfilling expression of who I am. I would have been an excellent uh, kindergarten teacher. I would have loved to be with kids. I would have loved that. I would have been a fantastic corporate coach, right? I would have been an excellent guidance counselor in a high school. I would have absolutely loved being a yoga teacher. But the commonality of all of it is just loving people and walking the journey with them. So sometimes it really amazes me when I look at Mira from the outside, right? I have those moments of looking and observing myself and I think, why regression? And then I say, well, we love the mystical. Why not? If people want to ask you questions, is it best to reach you through your website or your YouTube channel? Yeah, best is actually emailing me. Email me info at miracelli.com. And obviously my YouTube channel is a place where I constantly post and share. My podcast is available that way as well. Um, and, and also all my classes, everything I, I teach, but the deepest work obviously happens when I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. 
Mira, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Most definitely. I want to tell everybody how incredibly loved we are, that none of us is a mistake. None of us is oh, an afterthought in the mind of the divine. All that is is not all that is without us. I worked with a client who experienced how souls are created. And she told me that within all that is, all of a sudden, there's the awareness of hunger, a missing, a desire for a new growth and development. And that is fulfilled by a new soul being created that will embody those gifts and talents and principles, those soul patterns. And so when the divine creates us and this and this client shared how we're created through intention and light. Uh, that's how our souls are created. So before we are created, each one of us was wanted and loved and seen the value of, and then we're created and we're given free will. And we come here on earth and we forget our magnificence. We forget how extraordinarily supported we are. And so there we are thinking, Oh, well, oh, well, who am I? I've got nothing to offer. Things never work out for me. And meanwhile, the divine is right there serving us and wanting to grow through us and is saying, just, just drop that so I can put all that love and support into your hands. And so I'm here to tell everyone, you're so loved. You're so supported. Just allow yourself to release, to receive that love, trust it and let it flow through you. Mira, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me. It was so enjoyable to be with you, Jeff. Thank you and thank you, Mara. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.